Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another Alter-G Anti-Gravity Treadmill webinar. Uh, this is Jake and Chen. I'm the clinical specialist with Alter-G. Uh, we make the anti-gravity treadmills with a bionic leg. And today, I wanted to focus on our anti-gravity treadmill technology. So what I want to do in today's webinar is talk a little bit about the application of the anti-gravity treadmill with neurological rehabilitation uh, with neuropatients. And we want to talk about uh, motor learning principles, review some of that at the beginning, how to apply that with body weight, uh, body supported treadmill training. And then we're gonna um, discuss a little bit of the application of the Alter-G with Parkinson's rehabilitation. And then finally, we're gonna review some guidelines so you know how to apply it to these uh, patient populations. So rehabilitation for patients is fundamentally a process of relearning how to move to carry out their needs successfully. So we're trying to help people either understand their situation if they're spinal cord patients and relearn how to do transfers, um, learn wheelchair mobility, or if it's a stroke patient, then we're trying to help them uh, regain function, maybe try to uh, regain use of the hemi side. Uh, if we can do that and they can kind of practice, they can kind of get some repetition, then hopefully they'll continue to see gains in their function. So let's start by talking about motor learning. So motor learning is still relatively new in the field of PT. We're still learning more and more about it every, uh, every day. Uh, and there's a difference between active learning and passive facilitation. With active learning, what you're trying to do for the patient is help them uh, develop new skills, help them to retrain parts of the brain that have been damaged. Um, these uh, synaptic connections um, are continually being modified. The neuroplasticity that we have is what allows for motor learning. And cortical functions can take on different, cortical areas can take on different functions. So, you know, we all know there's the sensory and the motor homunculus and, you know, different uh, size uh, areas uh, designated for different functions. And so when there's damage to certain areas, you're gonna have loss of function in those specific areas that um, the brain controls. Now, the great thing is that other areas can learn those functions. So one hemisphere or one section can take over for loss of function in the other. So some of the principles we use to take advantage of the neuroplasticity to be able to provide motor learning or help patients with motor learning is the understanding of use it or lose it. If you don't use a certain skill or don't apply it, um, then those areas in the, in the cortical, um, in the homunculus, don't develop. You know, as you can see, the fine motor, if we go back to this picture, um, the fine motor areas are a little bit larger usually. Look at the hand, um, you know, versus the foot. So, you know, if we don't use our, our skills that develop certain areas, then you're going to lose those areas. So use it or lose it. Be sure you're practicing your functional skills. And perfect practice makes perfect. So mass practice is a term you're gonna hear a lot when it comes to motor learning. It just means that we need a lot of repetition. And repetition needs to be good quality repetition because you can also learn bad motor patterns. You can learn to limp. You can learn to move your arm incorrectly by elevating your scapula too much. So you gotta make sure that your practice is perfect and you replicate that. Active participation. So you need the patient to be involved. In order for them to really learn, they need to be controlling um, function, movement um, in their upper or lower body. Uh, it can't be someone doing it for them all the time. Initially, you may need to do that to provide some type of feedback. So with harnesses um, over treadmills, you can provide a little bit of um, manual cueing, um, tactile cueing to these patients uh, with regards to lower limb, uh, lower body placement. But after a certain time, you want to kind of remove that feedback. You want to try and have the patient rely on themselves versus the therapist. So, you know, slowly you want to remove that, and that's where the anti-gravity treadmill fits in. We can really help patients learn um, on their own without relying on um, tactile cues because they can still respond to visual, um, auditory, um, proprioceptive feedback. And the specificity of training. We want training to be in natural environments. So if we're working on walking, we want it to be as close to walking as possible. You can certainly use um, you know, a stationary bike or other um, cardio equipment to build strength to work on cardiovascular endurance, but if it's practicing gait, 
then you've got to practice gait and you want to do it in as close environment as possible. So uh, gait in a pool is not going to be as close, as accurate as walking uh, in the anti-gravity treadmill. So what I want to do now is talk a little bit about body weight supported treadmill training. So for neurological conditions, this is a um, modality that really helps patients with repetition. It can really help with motor learning because they can get uh, mass practice of walking. Patients that are not comfortable, that don't have very good balance, that are a little bit deconditioned, the harness provides support. Body weight support um, gives them confidence. In it, they can work on static or dynamic balance. They can work on their gait training, their pattern. It enables functional activity. The challenge with a lot of uh, modalities that provide body weight support treadmill training is they're not very comfortable. <coughs> so harnesses, you know, especially if you have to provide a lot of support, um, tend to pull a lot on the skin. They pinch in certain areas. Um, and patients just don't want to be on it very long. With the anti-gravity treadmill, we provide a, a lot more comfort because we use special shorts to support you um, inside the uh, anti-gravity treadmill. So let's talk a little bit now about treadmill training itself. So this is a standard treadmill study. It's not an anti-gravity treadmill study, but I want to highlight the importance of mass practice and the importance of task-specific training. So this was performed by McCain et al. Um, about 18, on 18 individuals after they had a stroke. They did daily 30-minute sessions of treadmill training before they went to overground. So you want to try not to fatigue people. Um, they have to have pretty good endurance to do this but afterwards they need to practice over ground to get carryover. And what they saw was increased walking speed, functional levels, and no falls over a six month period. They were also able to increase metabolic demand by increasing the speed. So task specific interventions are really important for motor learning. This uh, study here by Bello et al looked at treadmill training with Parkinson's patients. So they had 22 Parkinson's patients with the typical um, shuffling gait, the festinating gait. They didn't have a very good stride length. And so they were assigned randomly to a treadmill group or overground group. They trained for five weeks, three times a week. And what they saw was the treadmill training group, not the overground group, showed an improvement in stride. The treadmill group also showed improvements in the timed up and go and static posturography. So again, task-specific interventions are important for getting motor learning. And in this case, it helped these uh, patients with better uh, balance, um, better uh, um, step length, stride length, which then usually tends to translate to uh, less fall risk um, and better uh, uh, function and quality of life. So there's a lot of tools that people use, a lot of different modalities for body weight support. You can use parallel bars, harnesses, pools. The difference with the anti-gravity treadmill is we're able to provide precise control of body weight support. So you know exactly where patients are from 100% um, of body weight on their legs all the way down to 20%. So we can provide up to 80% of support in 1% increments. So you can you know, set the weight support exactly to where the patient needs. You don't have to give them too much. Um, you can track progress. And there's normal gait mechanics. So we have EMG studies that show that the muscle firing patterns are exactly the same in the anti-gravity treadmill as they are over ground. The only difference are the peaks are not as high. So normal gait mechanics are preserved. The ability for patients to respond to visual feedback. So when you're in a pool, it's kind of hard for them to see what their legs are doing. It's hard for them to see um, how to respond to the therapist's cues. But with the video monitoring system and now with our new StrideSmart technology, patients can respond to the physical therapist, um, you know, in, encouraging them to put more weight on one side, encouraging them to take a bigger step, encouraging them to walk faster. So there's a lot they can do to, um, to um, encourage motor learning. Greater comfort and safety is, is one of the highlights as well in the anti-gravity treadmill. Because of that, patients are willing to, to work longer sessions. In the anti-gravity treadmill, we've had stroke patients I go up to 45 minutes just practicing gait and standing and weight shifting, uh, something you wouldn't normally see because they would fatigue. 
So in the rehabilitation setting, what happens or what does it look like? Well, the anti-gravity treadmill was a, used in this study by Nancy Beal out of UCSF with some Parkinson's patients. She had 10 subjects and they participated in a body weight supported treadmill training program two times a week for eight weeks. They performed simultaneous motor and cognitive tasks while aerobic training. So she would often have them, you know, throw a ball while they were walking, uh, performing word problems, uh, just a lot of tasks so, so they, they weren't just focused on their gait pattern. And what you saw was improvements in depression, independence, balance, and fall reduction. So improved function, improved quality of life for these patients. In this study out of Samuel Merritt University, uh, Professor Rolando Lazaro worked with um, 10 healthy elder adults in the anti-gravity treadmill. He had them perform eight weeks of exercise at a self-selected walking speed. And he saw improvements in balance, mobility, and lower extremity strength. Again, highlighting that safe, task-specific challenges in the L2G could improve patient outcomes. So if you can get better balance, mobility, strength, this is going to transfer to less fall risk. Um, you know, patients would be maybe more willing to do close kinetic activity. So if it's an elderly patient that has osteoporosis, that has deconditioning, they can get some good results. So what do we know about the Alter-G anti-gravity treadmill? Well, first of all, it's safe. It's going to provide this environment where patients don't have to worry about falling. So they can work on their gait patterns. They can work on standing balance. They can work on lower extremity strength. It maintains the normal mechanics in the lower extremity. So as I mentioned, because there's only air inside, there's no resistance to walking. So it's not like water. It's not like being in a pool. You have normal mechanics preserved. The Alter-G allows for increased repetition of higher level activities and exercise. So with motor learning or, the, or trying to get motor learning, the goal is massed practice of task specific activities. And you can do that in the Alter-G. So they can learn those movement patterns with proper feedback from the physical therapist. Um, you can get visual feedback with the video monitoring system. Patients can respond to those verbal cues and they can understand where they need to position their body uh, to again, encourage that motor learning. You can provide variable levels of assistance. So you can challenge the patient with increasing body weight, increased loading, removing that body weight support. You can work on uh, incline, going backwards and forwards, uh, speed. So a lot of different levels of challenge for patients. Now, how do you use it? So you know that these patients can do well, they get all these benefits from the body weight support, but how do you use it? Well, our indications are very generic because we want people to try with different patient populations. So you can see there's nothing really specific about the diagnoses, about the conditions, about the patients. It's pretty wide open. There are certain things that clinicians have been successful with, but we don't have studies on. So we recommend them as precautions. Um, you know, cardiovascular disease, um, back problems, uh, rupture herniated discs, you know, pa uh, patient populations um, with these conditions have been uh, successful using the anti-gravity treadmill. Again, clinicians will try it with patients they think may benefit. A lot of them do, but we, again, don't have those studies, so we can't recommend it for all patients. So with those patient populations, it's up to the clinician and their expertise and their comfortability with how they want to apply it. The only three real contraindications are unstable fractures or joints, anybody that has an active DVT, and cardiovascular hypotension. The goal of the anti-gravity treadmill is to enable safe, close kinetic chain activity and gait training. So focus on the functional activity for the patient. Don't focus on the diagnosis. So whether it's a CVA, a TBI, Parkinson's, um, you know, respiratory conditions, cardiovascular, focus on their functional activity. Don't think about the diagnosis. Because typically it's not gonna be a question of if patients are appropriate, but when. So if you're getting a patient up standing, you're working on gait training, they're gonna be appropriate. Think about what the goal is for the patient. If it's functional task specific training, if you're working on those skills, like pre-gait activities, weight shifting, 
sit to stand, um, transfers, you know, walking, those are all going to be patients that are appropriate for the Alter-G. So you want to think more about these skills versus the diagnosis. It's not if, but when. And so if you look at your functional, um, your FIM scores, you want to make sure that they are at least a three or higher. Modest or above is what we recommend. Once you get down into the, the max and the dependence, it's much more challenging um, to get them in and out of the anti-gravity treadmill. And then the questions I always have is, are there other things they should be working on? You know, if they're max assist, can they work more on just standing outside in, in parallel bars with the therapist in front of them? So the therapist can provide some manual assistance, some tactile cueing uh, versus being in the Ultra-G. If they're more modest assist, they've got a little bit better motor control, they can position their lower extremities well, yeah, they'd be great for the anti-gravity treadmill. So if you have one of your facilities, start by thinking of the higher level patients first, not the lower level ones. Those that are able to walk, see if the Alter-G can help them walk better. If they got some of those skills, see if the Alter-G can help them progress faster to get those successful outcomes. So some things that I like to think about when uh, I try to identify a patient is, can they transfer some sit to stand with moderate assistance? Again, if they're max assist, if they don't have the strength, then you're gonna have a much harder time getting them in and out of the anti-gravity treadmill. Can they stand with minimal assistance? If they use their upper extremities, like in, a par in parallel bars, that's fine. Um, if they're able to stand with some help from the therapist, that's fine as well. Do they have lower extremity motor control? Do they scissor? Are they able to, to contract, uh, are they able to correct their lower extremity by contracting the appropriate muscles to position the lower extremity? And do they have good sitting balance and trunk control? If they don't have good trunk control, there are things that you can try and do in the anti-gravity treadmill, but then you have to ask yourself, are they gonna become a functional ambulator? Because if they don't have trunk control and they need someone next to them all the time, maybe that's something to work on first. And then as they get better and they improve, again, then you work on the lower extremities uh, when they start to be able to walk on their own with a walker or uh, walk with some uh, assistive device, the anti-gravity treadmill can play a role in decreasing the use of those assistive devices. So how do you get someone into the Alter-G? Well, you have them put on the shorts first, and then you can use the shorts to help them. I always recommend having a gait belt, though, because um, you don't want to be tugging on the shorts too much. It can lead to some added wear and tear. And plus, after they're zipped into the bag, you won't have anything to hold on to. So use an additional gait belt, and I would rather you know, um, use that to support my patients as they enter and exit. You can stabilize the bag or frame to help the patient to enter. And once they're inside the cockpit, remind the patient to stand straight, nice and steady, not to be sitting down or trying to, to um, once you're, they're zipped in, sit in the shorts. Because when they sit down, what happens is their center of gravity moves outside of their base of support. And then what happens is the treadmill starts to, to roll forward or back because there's no brake on it. It's a standard treadmill. So you can help if someone's behind, they can push through the bag to provide a, a virtual brake, uh, if you will. But the key is keep the patients standing with the center of gravity over the base of support. If that happens, the treadmill, the belt won't move. Um, you may need to provide a little support if, it, if they're not in that position and then have the patient lift up their legs and place, them, place it under them. Don't try to push right, and, and try to roll the treadmill belt because then again, it'll move. Have them actually pick up their legs and place it under them. Patients that are deconditioned or closer to modicist may need more assistance to get in and out. So um, again, with that gate belt on, it'll provide that support. Uh, but if they're really having a difficult time, you can use a tub transfer bench. This is a, a technique that came out of one of our skilled nursing facilities in Colorado. What they did was they took the end off of a tub transfer bench and they put uh, the short end on the treadmill. The long end they adjusted so it would be touching the floor. So then what the patient does is they just do a stand pivot from their wheelchair or from another chair to the tub transfer bench. They can then slide towards the cockpit or the opening uh, and then once they're there, they put their feet in the opening and all they need to do is perform a sit to stand. Then you remove the tub transfer bench, lift up the frame and lock it in place, zip the patient in, calibrate. 
So the patient really doesn't have to stand or walk very long. And then once they're in and then you give them body weight support, they should be able to stand a little bit better. And then all you need to do to get out is reverse the procedure. You hold the patient up by the gate belt, unzip after you've uh, turned off the Alter G, and then place the temp transfer bench on the treadmill after you lower the cockpit. So there's the example of the temp trans transfer bench. What you do is remove the legs and the armrest from one side, keep the legs on the other side. You can remove the backrest as well. And all the patient has to do is slide on the bench up to the cockpit. So once the patient's in the anti-gravity treadmill, what do we do with support height? Well, the higher you set it, the more support the patient's gonna get if they don't have as good trunk control. The lower you set it, the less support it's gonna give them. So it depends on how you wanna challenge your patients. In general, we say that it should be at the level of the greater trochanter, just because you don't wanna affect arm swing. The higher you get with the cockpit frame, you're gonna affect the arm swing. And then you wanna monitor, so you can, uh, use a chest monitor, uh, pulse oximeter, blood pressure, uh, telemetry. These things can all be used with the anti-gravity treadmill. Um, it won't, the Alter-G won't interfere with it. So start your patient slow in the anti-gravity treadmill. About 10 minutes max, uh, probably not more than that. You want to not change more than one parameter between sessions. Uh, remember not to exhaust your patient. You want to leave some time for them. Um, to do overground training. Uh, if you exhaust them and they can't do overground training, then you don't get to practice in their actual real life situation. So you wanna have them be able to um, get some carryover and so you wanna practice over ground. Um, if you change more than one parameter, it gets confusing to, to know which one is affecting the patient. And if they're sore, you don't, you don't wanna change any parameters at all for the next session. What I usually do is I work on the kinematics first, meaning I try to work on step length, stride length. I work on endurance, so I may increase the amount of time that they're in the anti-gravity treadmill. And then lastly, the body weight support. So I don't wanna to rush to increasing body weight support right away. I wanna work on those other things first. So get comfortable with the anti-gravity treadmill. Try it yourself so you understand what it feels like, how you can describe it to patients. Uh, how easy it is to get in and out. Start with your simple orthopedic conditions. So maybe like a total knee or a total hip, maybe someone that just has um, you know, decreased endurance. So people that can actually uh, ambulate, that can walk but not well, those would be better, better candidates as well initially. So you get comfortable with using it. Uh, and then as you get comfortable, then you can progress to patients that are a little bit more difficult with the Alter-G. Those that have more difficult time standing, you can use this, the tub transfer bench method to get in and out. You can have the Alter-G for working on endurance, for challenging patients with single limb stance activities. And so as you get better, you can kind of really work on gait patterns. So patients that maybe you don't feel as comfortable with, you can um, you know, wait a little bit for those, um, maybe get a little extra support. And you can see that once they're in, the patients feel more comfortable challenging themselves, um, responding to your cues, um, increasing uh, sessions. So orthopedic conditions that are limited by pain are great because the body weight support removes the um, ground reaction forces, um, the loading on the limb. They're gonna be much more comfortable. Progress to those neuro patients that need minimal assistance next. Uh, work on standing balance, weight shifting, pre-gait. So if they have the ability to walk, it just the uh, gait pattern is antalgic, they weight shift too much to the uninvolved side, those are great patients. They can get in, you can work on weight shifting toward the involved side. So they can really load either the orthopedic um, you know, surgery side, load the hemi side. So those are all things you can work on uh, in the anti-gravity treadmill. So the Alter-G anti-gravity treadmill provides safe, comfortable body weight support. It increases the standing and walking time for patients, which allows them to increase practice. Increased practice of task-oriented training results in improved motor learning and functional skills. So repetition, 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 and it's perfect practice makes perfect. So it's gotta be uh, repetition of the correct gait mechanics, correct standing. You don't wanna ingrain or teach a bad pattern. 
So hopefully that gives you an idea of how to apply the anti-gravity treadmill with neurological patients, um, trying to get better motor learning, uh, try to encourage more mass practice, more task-oriented training with body weight support. So that's all I have today. Hopefully this uh, provides you some uh, insight. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us at marketing at altergy.com.